Hello, and welcome back to The Independent Pianist. It is your host, Cole Anderson, as always. And today I'm going back to my series on Chopin's wonderful etudes. I've done a few etudes already on the channel, Opus 10 number 1, Opus 25 number 1, and Opus 25 number 5, which you can find on my Chopin playlist, which should be coming up right about now. Today we are looking at the final etude that Chopin wrote. So this is from his second set of etudes, Opus 25, and it is the final piece. Now there's an obvious connection between this piece and the very first etude from his Opus 10 collection, number one. Uh, the key, of course, C major in Opus 10, number one, and then C minor here. But also, it's pretty obvious when you hear them side by side that the figuration is also meant to be highly reminiscent. this self-referencing, Chopin is also pretty obviously reaching back to reference one of his great loves and one of his great inspirations, which is of course the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. This piece could almost be seen as a kind of apotheosis of his whole relationship to Bach. Chopin loved Bach, he taught Bach to his students, he played the music for himself very frequently, and it was a great inspiration on his workmanship and on many of his musical ideas that he explored, notably ideas of counterpoint, chromatic harmony, and formal unity. Here it's pretty easy to see a relationship to the first two preludes from the Well-Tempered Clavier, the C major and C minor preludes respectively. And we can see this relationship in a number of ways. First and most obviously, of course, is just this idea of having a prelude type structure, an improvisatory kind of structure, where you have the same figuration, rhythmical and technical figuration, repeating throughout the piece. However, beyond that, there are many little signatures that Bach uses in his compositions, which Chopin also echoes here. So for example, in the opening bars of Chopin's etude, he does something which theorists like to call a tonic prolongation. He circles around the tonic harmonically using dominant replacements and actually in his case keeping the bass on the tonic, so keeping a pedal point on C. And you can see that Bach uses this exact same technique in these first two preludes from the Waltemberg Clavier. In fact, it was a technique which he used very frequently indeed. So let's hear those two preludes, just the opening bars, so you can hear the tonic prolongation, which I've also marked in the score. There's another very obvious way in which Chopin's etude is reminiscent of Baroque ideals and also of Bach's music, and that's in the use of the so-called Picardy Third. And a Picardy Third, you will recognize immediately when you hear it, it's this idea of ending a piece in a minor key suddenly with a major chord at the end. With no preparation, you just have that major chord at the very end. So here's an example of that from the end of the fugue in C minor from the Walter Clavier, book one.
So it's a very striking effect. It was very widely used in the Baroque era. It was not only Bach's thing, definitely, but it was a striking aspect of his music as it was for many others. And Chopin definitely uses that here at the end of this etude. The interesting thing about Chopin's use of the Picardy Third is that he actually foreshadows it in the opening phrase as well. In fact, the entire ending phrase of the piece is used at the end of the opening section almost note for note. He just extends it a little further at the ending and he adds a coda. So that gives a wonderful kind of circularity to the structure that the end of this piece is also its beginning. And I think in addition to the kind of circular technical pattern, which of course runs through the entire piece, is what lends this music its air of eternal meaning and timelessness, along with this figuration, this circular figuration, kind of like the spokes of a wheel or something like that. Now, in regards to the technical difficulty of this etude, this etude is usually regarded as being one of the easier ones among Chopin's etudes, and there is some basis for that idea. Unlike Opus 10 No. 1, this etude does not require that your hand cover any distance wider than an octave. All the shapes are fairly basic and compact. However, behind this kind of easier looking facade, there's actually a very subtle kind of difficulty which is very difficult to bring to a high level of achievement. And that has to do, of course, with the repeated note, which is the whole uh, technical difficulty in essence. If you look carefully at the figuration, you'll see that there's always a repeated note, which is repeated at every octave. So you have to replace your fifth finger with your thumb and vice versa when you're going down the figuration. And to get this really clean and clear is indeed a very difficult thing. So I know that to learn this etude was very, very simple, but to get to the point where I felt that the technique was really solid was very difficult. Uh, the fact that this piece is so easy on the surface but actually hides this kind of difficulty behind it is why you hear so many pianists actually play the piece quite badly. Uh, usually pianists who are very ambitious but perhaps not so experienced yet uh, with their technical development. Now to be honest even playing the piece badly is going to do a lot of good for your technique anyway but just be aware that you're gonna have a much longer journey to bring this piece to actual perfection. I know that that was the case for me. I played it when I was in my teens and didn't play it particularly well. And coming back to it, I really realized uh, what was off at the time. But with experience, I now realize how to actually realize these technical difficulties clearly and effectively. Now there are two major buildups of intensity which occur in this piece, and they're two of my favorite passages in all music. There's a big buildup leading up to the recapitulation at the end of the development, where it sounds like we're going to get that C major harmony again, that Picardy third that we heard at the very beginning of the piece. But he denies us that release, and instead we go back to C minor. So here's the first big buildup. He does repeat the opening little gesture exactly from the, from the beginning, but then he extends the music a great deal. He doesn't immediately go to C major like he did in the first phrase. Instead, he goes through a Neapolitan harmony, or the flat two harmony, and emphasizes the subdominant harmony. The subdominant in C minor would be F minor, and this also is a very typical practice of Bach. So the number of pieces in Bach which do not contain some kind of emphasis on the subdominant in their final pages would be a very small number of pieces indeed. In fact, I think it might not even exist. And usually what you'll see is what's called a tonicization of four at the end of any Bach piece. Supposing that we're in a piece in the key of C minor, you'll almost always see a dominant seventh chord on C on the tonic, which acts as a dominant for the subdominant. 
F minor. So you can see that actually happening at the end of the C minor prelude. It happens right here in this kind of cadenza-like passage. The first chord is the dominant chord, and then we have the F minor chord. It also happens at the end of the C major prelude. In this case, it's F major, of course, because we're in a, in a major key, but you see the same thing. Here's the dominant seventh chord built on the root of C, so that's the tonic of the whole piece, and then after that, F major. So this practice of kind of extending the final cadence and intensifying the final cadence by emphasizing the subdominant before going to the actual dominant and the tonic of the, of the home key was very typical of Bach, and it does have, for that reason, a very Baroque kind of sound to our ears. I'm sure Bach was not the only one who did this, but of course, since this was Chopin's model, it makes sense that he references this exact technique. So you can see the same thing here. Chopin actually reaches a C major chord a little early, but we don't hear it as the Picardy third. We don't hear it as the final cadence on a major chord yet, because the previous harmonies have set us up so that we feel like we're in the key of F minor temporarily. That's what gives this final cadence its delicate feeling of unrest. And that's also partly why it feels so incredibly satisfying this last time when we finally do reach that C major cadence. So it's a really brilliant kind of structure, and it's really Chopin's own, uh, inspired by the Baroque ideals. I don't know of a Baroque piece which does this, having the Picardy third at the beginning of the piece and then again at the end. It's quite possible that such an example exists. If you do know of a piece like that, please comment and let me know, because I'd be very curious to know if there was maybe a more precise model that Chopin was thinking of when he wrote this piece. But as far as I know, it's Chopin's own original idea, and of having these two build-ups which the first one kind of makes us feel like we're going to arrive at C major, but then denies us, and then the second one is extended very, very long, and then we finally get this arrival back at C major. It just has a wonderful feeling of completion and release when you finally reach that point. So this piece oftentimes suffers in comparison to its perhaps more famous neighbor, the Winter Wind Etude, Opus 25, number 11. But this one musically is just as much a work of genius, and it really fully justifies its place as the final etude in the set, tying everything together, bringing us back full circle to where we started. Now, as far as how to perform this piece, of course, people have many different ideas. I feel that its roots in this kind of improvisatory Baroque form, the keyboard prelude, justifies a great deal of rhythmic freedom. There's a very rhetorical quality to the music, and again, a very improvisatory feeling in how the composer is searching from key to key and trying to find his way through the maze of harmonies. I think a certain rhythmic freedom is also justified based on the way in which Chopin marks interior voices in the texture. So you might have noticed that at the beginning of the piece, there is this kind of rhythmic structure which is set up with an accent on the downbeat, in the bass of the piano, and then another accent in the middle of the bar in the treble, kind of like the tolling of a gigantic bell or, or something like that. Well, later on, Chopin develops this idea in kind of a subtle way. He has inner parts in the treble kind of coming out of the texture, not always on downbeats either. They're oftentimes in the middle of beats or on weak uh, 16th notes. So it gives the impression that there are these little echoing, answering voices kind of emerging out of the texture. Almost like we're hearing some kind of chorale in the background behind this raging tempest.
And you'll hear in the way that I'm playing this that I'm actually taking a little bit of time. I'm kind of stretching out the places where those inner voices come out and playing them a little slower compared to uh, the regular figuration. And I think really only by doing this can you make those voices come out clearly to the listener in a way which is really satisfying. Otherwise, the piece is going to inevitably sound kind of clattery and mechanical. And I think you should avoid anything mechanical or clattery in this piece, if at all possible. In fact, that goes for all Chopin's etudes. While each etude does showcase a particular technical problem, that should be transcended into the realm of poetry. All these etudes are mini tone poems of great breadth and emotional meaning, and they should be played with that in mind. So thank you for watching. Uh, the complete performance of Chopin's Ocean Etude, Opus 25, number 12, is coming up in a moment. Please do hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, uh, come back next week, I'll have some more conversation, more great music for you. If you like this content, consider making a financial donation. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash independent pianist, or I have other methods of making financial donations in the description box. If you're interested with studying with me online, you can also drop me an email at cole at independentpianist.com. I do teach students online. And last but not least, if you want to book me for a concert, a house concert, or any other kind of recital, I'm always happy to discuss doing that, as I love to share my music in person, just like I do on YouTube. Thanks for watching, take care, and keep practicing.